everyone. I have uh, to warm up a little bit since I arrived. I've, um, you know this Cafe India place, Mother India? Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Recovering from that last night was that's amazing. Um, and then waking up and having breakfast and then Noe just making lunch. I feel like I need to wake up a bit. Um, but some of you in Noe's class uh, this morning, um, I believe, watched Lyft and Calais, two quite early films that I made. So I was wondering whether, I mean, I have a sort of structure as what I want to talk about, but I'm more than happy to improvise. And you should absolutely, you know, ask anything at any time because it's, there's nothing worse than just sort of speaking at you. I mean, it's really just, you know, I do what I do and it's sort of now second nature. And it's only situations like this where I get the time to reflect on it and when I, and when I teach. But, you know, often you forget <clears throat> what you do so obvious to you that maybe other people won't, you know, that you, I assume that you're just going to understand it, but just feel free to ask anything because that's what, that's what I'm here for, so please do. But are there any reactions to those films that you want to start with? Because that might be a nice way to kind of launch into discussion for those of you who saw either Lyft or Calais or anything else that you've seen that I've made before. But don't be shy, just uh, ask anything. From how much did it cost to why did you make it or why did you bother? <laughs> I saw all three of those first in this one and, and I thought they were brilliant. And what was fascinating, I feel like you know, the relationships were built on camera. You know, I don't know how much of the you know, relationships ended when the camera was switched off, it was all happening. Especially with the left, it was like it was all happening when the camera was off. And, and things happened after, like, after that, but between the takes. Yeah, okay, there's sort of a lot there. But you're, you're basically asking, it feels like the, the relationship's happening as as we're, as we're watching it. Um, it's true that, I mean, I have to unpick that a bit. I mean, it's true that in a lot of cases that, you know, that is what's going on. Um, did you, are you referring more to Lyft and Kelly or in both of the films? Well, I just, I just thought Lyft, Lyft was just the simplicity of what was the restriction. Yeah. With so, yeah. I mean, the Lyft film, it's very specific because, um, with that film, in the beginning, I didn't want to meet anybody before filming. Why do you think that might have been? I'm gonna throw, often I throw back things in because it's sort of interesting for you to think about. Why do you think that I might, in that film, have not wanted to, apart from some, you know, to know that that was the place I wanted to film in and that there were potentially interesting people there, why do you think I might have not spent a hell of a lot of time doing in detailed research with the characters before actually going in and starting the filming process. Yeah, I mean, my, in, my, in the very idea, like right at the beginning, and it's, it's a, it's, it was a weird sort of genesis of this film because I was working on a fiction film actually, and one of the locations was a tower block, and we would ride in the elevator every day to get up to the top floor to this location, and the idea for the film came about through that experience. And I didn't film it in that location, I went to a whole new different place. So I did seek out <clears throat> another place, another location, and then I needed to know that um, there were going to be enough you know, interesting people there, as I say. Um, in terms of what, what I thought the film was going to be about, it was very simple. I had an idea that it was a sort of interesting, awkward situation to be in, and that, that in itself was quite stimulating. Um, and, I, and the, the very few, few thoughts that I had, one was that, you know, would I be able to make a film where I tap into what's going on in people's lives in that very moment that I meet them? And also this idea of the encounter, a stranger and myself meeting other strangers and what that leads to. It all felt very exciting and a possible film, um, you know, situation, a concept that could lead to interesting discoveries, you know? So in a sense, it's, it's the complete opposite of sitting at home for months, years, thinking of an idea, writing a script, you know, preparing it all, knowing what you want to say about the film, what it's, what it, what it's really about, what the message is going to be, um, you know, talking to endless producers about it, how to make the script perfect before you start to raise money. I mean, this is the complete opposite. Um, so you might ask yourself, well, how the hell do you get something like that made? I was lucky enough at, at the time that um, Channel 4 had money for experimental films, and even in the pitch for that, when I had to go into Channel 4 and speak to the commissioner about this film, it was extremely vague. All I could say was that I want to go and stand in the lift. I felt like a complete idiot, you know. 
I want to go and stand in a lift and make a film in a lift. It, I didn't have much more to say about it. Um, it just felt that it could be interesting. And I think because they had this money sort of put aside, ring fenced as, as accountants say, you know, they had this ring fenced money to take some risks. Um, and lucky enough, the commissioner was sort of tickled by it. Um, I remember in that meeting, he did say, well, you know, will you leave the lift or what's it going to be about? And I didn't really know how to answer those questions. I was extremely naive in a good way, I think. Um, but anyway, they commissioned the film and then I was set free. And it wasn't a huge amount of money, but it was £40,000, I think. I worked with a production company. I shot it, obviously, alone, but had a researcher. And the researcher met all the people in the block before I did. I Because I wanted to be sure that, of course, that, you know, there was... You know, I could, if I would have chosen that block in, let's say, a suburb of Birmingham in a very white working class area, it would be one kind of film, you know. I chose the location f sort of for, for, the, for demographic reasons. It was the East End of London, a very mixed community. But still I had to be sure that the individuals living there were going to be characters, as it were, you know. You often hear documentaries talking about their characters. I mean, I, I tend to use that word, I could use the word people, but they sort of become characters when you start thinking about how you know, how you're going to tell their stories and what the journeys are going to be. Um, so that was the sort of process. So I did literally turn up one day and all they knew was that there was going to be a film made in the lift and they had no idea what it was about because I didn't have any idea what it was about. I couldn't say to them, oh, I'm, looking, I'm very interested in, you know, um, Bengali immigration to the East End in 1973 or... I, mean, I didn't have any of those thoughts, you know, in the front of my mind at all. All I knew is that there was a interesting bunch of people living in this place on top of each other, side by side, and that was the starting point. So in the beginning of the film, luckily I have some clips lined up that uh, were near the beginning of this presentation that I was going to refer to. Um, and at what, at what stage did um, you f feel that it was a film? Yeah, maybe that, that will come in a minute, because uh, it's a process. The first, the first two weeks of the lift were like, were very exciting because um, I got to meet everybody, people were coming in, I was being called up to these floors, when the doors opened, you know, like the curtains of a stage, people would enter, and I had no idea who they were and what was going to unfold, it was all very, very exciting, and I got some really interesting little moments, and I also, uh, you know, understood and started to, in a way, cast the film in that, in that period by meeting people like, um, what was his name, Pete, uh, John I think his name was, um, and you know, getting a sense for them as characters and started to think about you know, the, their presence and what they could provide the film with in terms of the themes in their life. But after a couple of weeks I got thoroughly depressed, I felt like I hit a brick wall because I, I took some time off and I, and I started watching the VHS tapes that were transferred from the little DV cam tapes, uh, and I watched everything through and I, I panicked a bit because I'd never made a film before, although I'd worked on plenty of them, and I started to understand what sort of half an hour feels like, and I was really pan panicking about the narrative, you know, what would progress the film. Um, looking back, it, it's sort of obvious that I had to go back and, you know, bring back some of the people, hope that they come back and things that little things would develop in their stories. Uh, in order to give the film some sort of forward momentum. I mean, even the most sort of art house films where nothing happens in inverted commas, you know, you, everything has some sort of progression of some kind, otherwise you, you're stuck, <laughs> literally. Um, so that was a big kind of, an interesting moment for me where I had to really grapple with that um, issue around structure of the film and what was going to provide some narrative for the film. Um, and I think I came out of that with this realisation that I had to focus on some of the people there, things had to develop in, their, in my relationship with them or, or what we were going to discover about them. And of course, um, in the early days, I didn't even know whether I would leave the lift, so this, sorry about the delayed reaction to that. Um, I didn't know whether I would leave the lift at all and I tried leaving the lift at one point and if, for those of, those of you who have seen the film, uh, uh, okay, and you remember, maybe I have a clip of her somewhere, it doesn't matter anyway, but the old Jewish lady, Lily, who gets in the lift, 
Um, I tried filming her in her home. I literally followed her out of the lift and went into her flat. And she got totally confused about it. And I was sort of confused. Like, suddenly I'd left the sort of parameters of the film. I was like, why am I... I'm in her home and it felt like a whole other story could open up there. And I didn't really know what that was. Whilst I was in the lift, I felt very, to, to a point, you know, safe and certain that this was, this was the box I was supposed to be in and I shouldn't. You know, that, that experience made me realise that I shouldn't leave that space. And it taught me something, not at the time, but retrospect, retrospectively, very much about, you know, the, the, um, how limitations can be really useful for you. You know, especially when you're making a documentary and things, and the way I work, things are so open-ended. I mean, you need some limitations, so that was quite an interesting lesson. So then I decided to stay in the lift and try and progress these narratives with the people. Um, sometimes, in the early part of the film, people, people come in and, and you know, I try to reconstruct their reactions, if you like, in the editing. So anything that was too familiar, um, too personal, would be jumping ahead of what you're talking about, you know, because you would say you get a sense of my relationship with them unfolding. Anything in the first couple of minutes, uh, uh, you know, that didn't fit in with that, I didn't use in the beginning of the film because it had to have this sort of step-by-step -step progression. Um, so in the editing, I was, of course, recreating some of that experience. And, but it's completely artificial because you're putting aside things you might have filmed that were very forthcoming very quickly. Um, in reality, you know, so you're recreating a kind of chronology in a sense. And there were lots of moments where, well, I say lots, there were some moments where things just happened, you know, some strange conversations that proved to be interesting that are in the film, um, some other little situations. What, the best thing that happened, I think, probably was, I think I have that, I can dig that out in a minute, but um, there's a moment where I'm filming a drunk guy and an Asian girl with a headscarf gets in the lift and suddenly these two characters are there side by side. And it's interesting because it's just, you know, it, there's a lot of interesting juxtaposition going on in that frame and she gets out and then looks back at the camera and sort of horrified that she's being, being filmed and I don't, I don't know what happened because she didn't see I was actually in the lift filming her or what, but it's a really lovely moment. And some things like that just happened, you know. But part of the crisis was also realising that I could stand there for a year and maybe then get the film for half an hour and these little things just happen. But I also realised at that time I needed to do something. I needed to pr provoke some moments. Um, so whilst you watch the film and, you, you know, perhaps some of you think, wow, this is incredible, all these things just unfold, there was a lot of working things out behind the scenes. And in reference to your question also about how much research I might have done with the characters, after, after this moment of filming the first time, I then did go to their apartments and spend time with them and try to understand things in their life that I was interested in and how I could then bring that back to the lift to progress this film and make it into the kind of film that I wanted it to be. Um, although I didn't have a picture of how I wanted it to be, I, you know, I was related to very specific things at the time. To give you a concrete example of that, this guy who I'd met... Um, in the early days, before I filmed anything with him, I had some chats off camera in the lobby, and he was very keen to show us his apartment. Um, actually, you know what, I'm gonna play the clip first and then ask you a question about it. Let me just play this, it's a very short clip of 42 seconds. So at the beginning of that, he, it was a bit, the sound was a bit low, but he says, I've got a sauna and jacuzzi in the flat. Now, you know, generally people don't, that's, you know, it's not the first thing people tell you when you're in a lift together with them, necessarily. So how do, how do you think, because what we, you know, when we cut to that moment, I started right at the beginning, it's just somebody looking, then he starts talking. How do you think something like that emerges? Because I think when we watch these things in films, we just assume that, you know, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not, 
it's not a, exactly a, a fiction film we're watching here. They're real people, you know, um, even though some people I've noticed have commented on YouTube that they think that the whole film's completely fake and it's all, it's all actors. Um, that's quite interesting in itself. But how, how do you think like a moment like that might actually emerge in reality? I mean, you're all doing filmmaking practice courses, I presume. I mean, just to think about that, I mean, it's a very, you know, practical level. Yeah, I mean, basically it was a research, it was a research thing that happened. He, before I filmed anything with him, he, he wanted to invite myself and the researcher to his flat. He was super proud that he had a, a, jacu a jacuzzi and a sauna in this flat. And he had a landlord, he was renting a landlord, had done up this particular apartment to look like a penthouse. And he had this amazing view over the city and, and this pretty grim block, it was quite weird. I mean, I must say it's very expensive to be there now. But. So, um, he um, was very proud of that, and I thought, actually, that's quite a nice thing to have in the film. But you know, I'm not making, a, I'm not going to cut away to show images of his sauna and jacuzzi, you know, and just to illustrate my film is in. The, by that point, I understood that my film is in the lift, and you know, we're not going to, we're, we're never going to leave this place. <laughs> um, we're stuck here. So how how do I bring stuff to, to the lift? So I wanted him to talk about that, and so if you think about the clip specifically, just go back. Before this little moment, I would have said something to him like, you know, uh, tell me something about your flat, or whatever it was to provoke, you know. And I would have also managed the space before to say, look, don't say anything for a few seconds. I'd be turning over, there'd be silence, and suddenly he would just come out with it, having been prepared a little bit, yeah? Um, so that's how it happened, and it's really nice because he just starts to to talk, and it's you know I think some I mean I'm I've become more and more sensitive to how people talk in documentary films to pay attention to dialogue just as you would in fiction film, and part of casting for me is also you know thinking about how people talk about their own lives. So, you know, what kind of language do they use? Do they have an original way of talking and expressing themselves? You know, if you're inventing a character from nothing, you know, for a fiction film, you want them to, you know, you want them to have their own individuality. So I look for that in a person. It's part of what I think about when I'm casting for, for a film. Um, and I like, you know, I kind of fell in love with this guy for many reasons, the way he talked, the way he saw his own life. It's like kind of, you know, he represents a sort of, you know, lonely guy in the city looking for love and all of that stuff um, was going on. So I'm, man you know, I'm managing, as I say, sometimes things just happen, as it were, and other times I'm managing uh, in, a, in a way sometimes can be quite heavy handed and then I have to kind of pull back to make it really feel believable. Um, managing the scenes, you know. And I, you know, the word documentary is, is, is kind of meaningless, you know, actually, sometimes, because if, when you start to really unpick it, it, it becomes so many different things that it starts to lose its meaning completely. So I don't think it's actually useful to reflect on the term documentary very much, but there would be some filmmakers that would never work like this, that would never arrange or pr prepare or provoke things to happen. To get even a little small moment like this, they, they sort of feel that reality in inverted commas is sacred and that you should just be there as a, a fly on the wall, we've all heard that term, and just film it, you know. Um, I, I don't subscribe to that view. Most of the films I've made, when I'm actually in the process of making them, you know, so much of the reality is really dull and boring and is not worthy of being, you know, put onto film or to a digital card as it is these days. And process is so much about distilling things that are interesting out of the mass of stuff that's quite banal and everyday in a bad way, because I'm also fascinated by everyday people and everyday things. Um, but it's all about how to make that kind of really resonate. And, you know, in that sense, you're kind of inventing a, another kind of reality. So it's very difficult to say what is documentary about it. Yes, he's a real person. What I 
tried to pull out of his life feels truthful to me and that's all it sort of ever can be you know it's my view on these people and how they I'm trying to pull out things that, that resonate and feel truthful um, and hope that you will connect with it and feel the same because there's no other way to do it there's no sort of objectivity involved in, in all of this um, so I think that's really important to hold on to and I've you know, whilst, I mean, whilst we're on lift, I'll show you another little clip and then explain something behind it. So can I ask you a question? Yeah. <coughs> okay, yeah, go on. Sorry, just to say, when you asked him, you know, have you been drinking tonight, was that because you were interested to know that, when you thought the audience would be interested in asking questions because he had said something to Sarah's? That's interesting. I've never been asked that before. That's kind of an interesting thing to think about. I'm genuinely thinking about it now for the first time. I've heard this moment, you know, 50,000 times before. Seen the film far too much. Um, I think because he was a little bit, not drunk, but he had been drinking, I thought there was a certain, you know, I suppose I was feeling in that moment, and this is, you know, this is 15 years ago, so I'm really almost inventing a story here. I don't quite know what's true or not, but I probably would have been feeling that, you know, to, to, as a way to get to sort of get into his character to provoke him a little bit and also I was probably feeling that so and maybe you the audience wouldn't be I don't know I'm not I'm not so sure um, but what be, I mean on another note I mean my question to these people became became uh, you know a big part of the film and it was born out of that that sort of realization that if you just stand there and observe you don't you know you after some time in a situation like this, it's so boring that you end up killing yourself, you know, it's kind of terrible. So I would, but it became a sort of dream space. I would be there, you know, these people would walk in, I would sort of get time to just look at them, you know? And, and then out of that sort of looking, I would start to think of questions that, that could be interesting to ask that kind of person. You know, if I had to ask you a question, I would look at you and try and think, what could I ask you that might be interesting, you know? Not about whether it's a nice day outside or whatever, you know. So it kind of, kind of comes out of that. And um, some of those questions then, then came out of um, encounters outside of the lift, things that I knew about people that might have been through the researcher's early meetings with these people and his document that he sent me with the descriptions of their lives. For example, there's a religious sister that comes into the, the elevator, she's living there. Um, and I, I knew that she was a religious sister from the very early days. I knew there were two religious sisters living in the same flat together. And cheekily, I asked her at some point if she's ever been in love, which is not something you ask a religious sister. <laughs> and so, you know, for the audience, for you, it feels like a very, you know, natural question, a bit cheeky, but I mean, we have seen her before in the film, it's not out of nowhere. Um, but her reaction is really lovely because she's sort of, oh, no, 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 I'm a, I'm a religious sister. You know? and anyway, I thought, you know, she's slightly embarrassed about it and, and it makes for a very interesting moment, you know. Um, so it's, it's, it's about that, really. It's about finding ways to kind of make this reality that sort of doesn't exist anyway as, as interesting and, you know, I, you know, I... I it's not a word that I ever associate with documentaries, <laughs> but entertaining. You know? you want, whatever you're doing, however sort of, you know, whatever, you know, you want people to enjoy the film, engage in the film and, you know, cry and laugh and whatever with the characters and to be connected to them. So for me, it's all about finding that. Um, but as Noe said in the beginning, it's um, when she was referring to Nick Broomfield, you know, I think that, you know, television often is also doing that as well, you know, like the, of course, they've got to keep the audience hooked, but it, they, it, it often becomes very crass and scab picking and nasty, and people become freaks. And you know, you watch television, you know what it's like. And so, it's it's not that I want cheap laughs, or I'm, you know, I want you to really feel for these people and to think about the themes in their lives, the very universal themes in their lives, and you know, ultimately, so they reflect back on you. And you, you know, I don't, I try not to be any different from them in that sense. Okay, I have the power, I'm there with the camera, I can edit them in any way I see fit, you know, I could completely stitch them up, you know. But in the film, and it's also why you see me and I make an idiot of myself as well, in the film in terms of, you know, I show this slight idiotic guy in the lift 
filming these people, you know, I, I try not to sort of put myself in a situation that's above them, and so it, so it feels like a level playing field, you know. Even though, as I say, you know, I, I am the one constructing a story about them, so I do have a kind of power, of course, and I'm aware of that. This little moment here, if you can switch the lights. Let's have a little bit This is for you. Can you see it? Can you? This is for you. Two little two two elements to that short sequence. The first one of the Cypriot lady coming in with the, the rosary. She was somebody that had come into the lift before. We'd noticed her around the building. <coughs> um, actually, I'm not I'm not sure whether I'd filmed her necessarily before. But anyway, I was I was intrigued by her, and I, w I wanted to go and after being in the lift for some weeks, I wanted to go and um, meet her in her in her flat. And we went in there, and the flat was full of iconography. It was covered from floor to ceiling. Um, and I thought this was really interesting, and she was interesting as a character, and I wanted to get that into the film. So at the end of that chat with her in her apartment, I asked her if she would come in, you know, if she ever wanted to talk about religion to me, to, you know, to come into the lift and do it. So things like that. And she brings that in, and then you notice there's a cut before she puts them on the elevator. I think I must have asked her to stick them up on the wall because it would then provoke something else. And this guy, Asian guy that comes in then is provoked by that. And there's like a, a sort of chain reaction. And you can see in the, in the, in the editing of the film, we, some, we sort of enter a slightly sort of religious space with the music and the actual kind of shaft of the elevator. Then, you know, we take, we, we, we spend time there and, and then you come out of that into this conversation about Jews and the block. Um, see, a, a moment like that is interesting because I'd met, also met Jean, that woman there, in her own apartment, and she said exactly the same thing to me. That, you know, I, I was counting the white people the other night when I couldn't sleep. And she came in and she just, that time, she, I think I must have provoked, I didn't ask her to say that, but I would have said, you know, there are many, I think my question is even in there, there are many Jewish people. Well, she says, first of all, there, there aren't many Jewish, but I would have had my question and then cut it out. And she said exactly the thing, same thing again without me even asking her, which just highlights the importance of, of research. I knew, that I, was re you know, I knew that I was interested in that aspect of, you know, the old Jews living there who, who were feeling slightly like the world was changing around them and they were out of control and it wasn't like it used to be. I was in interested in that uh, idea. And then she came in and, and sort of, Gives it to me in a, a very succinct little nutshell with humour, and it's you know it's funny, it's awkward. Should she should she be saying that? You know, in fact she does. I love it. You know, I love people that say things that, that they shouldn't really say. Um, I very, I mean, I very rarely film with you know young people, partly because I it, it's something to do with the, you know they're very careful about what they say. You know, often just just of that generation, you know, very aware of the consequences of how they talk. If you watch back through my films, you'll often find characters that, you know, they, they do not sense themselves in any way, they just say, they're authentic, you know, they talk and say what they feel inside, and that's really important to me to, when I'm filming and casting to bring that out, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want people who are restrictive and, and are watching every word, um, 
it's partly the interest in the themes in their life and you know, the change and what's going on around them, but it's also a basic thing of, you know, these sort of authentic people are sort of much more interesting to me, the people that aren't sort of walking tweets, you know, on Facebook all the time, like we are, you know, so it's kind of, it's part of that. Um, are there any questions before I show you a clip that I was going to start with? Okay, I wanted, to, I wanted to show this. This is from a, the last feature film that I made called The Road. It's the opening sequence, and I wanted to show you. I think if you just, in your mind, if you just come up with one or two questions to ask me about what you think makes this particular scene documentary, because um, I think that would lead to some interesting uh, discussion about what documentary is. So just, just any, anything in it, whether the sound or what's going on in the image, the framing, anything you think makes it feel like a documentary, just, you know, just keep it in your mind and you can tell me at the end. So why is he like fire and to London? I left Ireland to pursue my dreams, to bigger and bigger things. What do you want to do in London? Uh, sing in bars, just find my feet, do more work. There's nothing back home in Ireland anymore. So what have you brought with you? My blanket, my pillow, guitar. My suitcase, myself. Why have you brought your pillow? To sleep on the bus. <laughs> More comfy. This is my leg. It's what, my mummy's. What will you miss about Ireland the most? Uh, probably my family. Not being able to see them every day. It's gonna be hard. about what, what you're watching, what you feel makes it a documentary or not, or anything. Up until I start speaking to it, it could be a drama. So you mean a fiction? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it could be, yeah. <laughs> but I guess even in some fiction films, that mimicking documentary, you hear the voice behind the camera. In some fiction films, I can think of characters even speak to speak to the camera in a similar way. So, yeah. Anything else? Somebody have their hand up over there. Um, the microphone is that like it's clear that it's one mic. So bad sound, basically, is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a, a rough. It's a rough cut and mixed clip, but yeah, there's a there's a sense that it's 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 kind of real sound, yeah, quite having to cope with the what's going on in reality, the weather and all of that, yeah. You could 
you could argue that's uh, a documentary aesthetic, I suppose. I think because she's talking about quite personal things, mm. and so she, she moved from Ireland and then she's going to London, and you're asking her what she's doing with the most, and that's quite personal, and you just describe yeah. a conversation like that. Yeah, so there's a, and that's partly the sort of questions thing, isn't it? That there's a conversation between us, um, which, you know, usually you don't, usually in fiction films that's removed. Right? There's a, but also, that, you know, there's a lot of documentaries that completely remove that, that type of dynamic, and, or they might use voiceover, recorded in the studio, you know. Yeah, I decided to leave Ireland because things weren't going so well, and it's very produced. <clears throat> voiceover where the image and the sound is completely separate and so but you're right I mean that probably is some sign that makes it feel authentic that you believe that she's really doing this journey and, and the personal aspect to it that you know you believe she's not an actress I take it she has an Irish accent <laughs> actresses can do Irish accents yeah, too You didn't believe her? That's interesting. In what sense? She, she, didn't, she didn't seem to be an actual to me. I don't care what <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> what bits don't you believe? What she's saying? Or? What she's saying and um, the crying as well. You know? Okay, that's interesting. Anyone else feel that? Oh my god, no, no, no two or three of you. <laughs> <laughs> So you're saying you don't, you're not sure whether she felt comfortable with me? Well, if she's not an actress, then she's a real person somehow. Yeah, but, <coughs> I, but you, are you saying that you felt that she was slightly uncomfortable with me? Or she, nervous? She, she looks, yeah, I, I also didn't believe in her reactions because she did several things which there's no reason for that, especially not smelling the scar several times. Yeah, okay. Now they're all interesting things because if you were writing a fiction and describing a character on a bus that's making a journey, you might get her to smell her, if you're a director, you might get her to, you know, smell her scarf because it's like a comfort thing, you know, she's leaving home. That would seem totally like an interesting little element in a script if you were writing a script as a detail, you know, um, and you're saying that you, you felt, it felt weird, you know, so I don't know, I mean, it, that's for you to decide, yeah, but... It, it's feasible that, you know, it, you know, it could be an interesting idea if it, if it was scripted. Um, anything else? Anybody picking up on? Yeah. I think maybe in some ways I felt a little strange that she was sort of telling you what she thought you wanted to hear, possibly. Okay. Which I think can be an issue with documentary where the subject kind of maybe knows the kind of thing you want to get out of them. That's interesting, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, there's a lot to discuss here because basically, what you've just seen is is a complete reconstruction. <laughs> so the three or four of you that are having some doubts are actually picking up on on things that probably are really going on there. Because I met her in London, and I was uh, the, the concept of this film is is looking at immigration on one on one road. So this. Uh, arch that she walks through, having come off the ferry, is in Hollyhead in North Wales, and at the other end of the road, in Marble Arch, is the Marble Arch, and most of it's in London, but she, she opens the film, and she brings us to London. Um, we started cutting the film, and she was a character in the film, but I, we didn't really have an interesting way to begin the film, so in the editing period, and we had a break, I decided with the editor that we should go back and try and shoot a scene like this. So. I was asking her to kind of redo that journey in some way, and so to kind of unpick it all, um, I, I said to her that she should bring a suitcase with anything she wanted in the suitcase to be in it, and you know anything that was going to help her kind of 
getting in touch with what it was like when she did leave. In reality, she left on a Ryanair flight and came to London, and it was a different journey entirely. Um, but that would have been sort of less interesting to me, and not on the road that I was filming on. Um, so, what I'm after is sort of an emotional truth of the leaving, rather than the sort of specifics and the facts of how she did arrive. So, you know, we're not we're not really interested in you know. There's nothing in this opening sequence that's giving you sort of factual information, it's much more of an emotional experience that I'm asking you to enter into. Go on. And are you pleased with the result? Am I? Yeah. Well, it's, it's very hard when you do something, I mean, I, 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 I believe her reactions um, in terms of, well, maybe I want to believe them, but I'm, in terms of that I think she is drawing on feelings that are really there, which might not just be connected to the leaving, but also she'd been in London for some time at that point. So she was, and she spoke a lot about home and missing and all of that. So I think she's drawing on real emotions. But it's put into a frame here that I've created as, you know, at the beginning of the film, and it's very specific, of course. So it's complicated, you know? um, I can't look at it objectively. I, you know, I've done this a few times in different situations. It's always interesting to me to see who picks up on it. People, usually, nobody, nobody questions it at all. They, they believe that she's doing it, this journey for real in that moment. You're, this must be a very good films department because some of you are learning to deconstruct them. <laughs> so I don't know, I mean it's kind of, I guess what's important is that sometimes I, in films I need to try these things out because it's the only way of me partly helping to construct a, a film that has some coherence and makes sense uh, later on in the editing, but also <clears throat> Before I start editing, sometimes I'm, you know, I've given you small examples of the lift that I'm doing things that I feel like I need to do that are going to help me to access certain areas that I can't do in any other way. Uh, and I don't want to feel that, therefore, that I can't do it and I should just give up on it uh, because it's not documentary like or whatever. For me, it's like if, it's, if there's another way around it that involves some level of uh, intervention whatever it may be, and they, they range from very small things like I've shown you in the lift to bigger things like this, then it's all kind of possible. And then the only important questions that come up is, is it ethical for me? Uh, and for, you know, is it gonna be a problem for the person I'm asking to, you know, to be involved um, in that moment with me? Is that, is, it gonna, is that gonna work? Is it gonna be okay for her? on different levels, um, and then whether you believe it as a scene, you know? and whether you're feeling the sort of emotional truth of it that I hope to be able to communicate. So that's sort of, the, that's sort of what's guiding me. But interestingly enough, because um, I'd done a master class about this film before it was shown on the BBC, and somebody in editorial policy at the BBC had seen the class, and I'd spoken about this stuff, and they got really uncomfortable about it and made me cut out my conversation with her at the bus stop for the television journey because they thought it would be misleading the audience. <laughs> um, so they made me cut out all that, that interaction. So all we, all we see is a girl arriving and then after this moment here, yeah, I, I narrate a couple of lines of narration and it sort of sets up some of the themes in the, in the film. And it, you know, it's still, it's, it's fine. You don't, you're not confused, but... Um, they felt that, that actually, so they were happy, happy for me to mislead visually, you know, knowing that it was all fake, but they wouldn't then allow this in case somebody complained or felt, you know, you might have found out, said, well, I didn't believe that, you know. <laughs> and it would be logged and, you know. So it's quite, it's an interesting thing to think about, you know, when you're making your films. I mean, what, you know, what, what, what can you do and what, what aren't you, you know, what you're allowed to do, what aren't you allowed to do? And there's no, you know, it's your own personal God that's going to tell, answer that question. There's nobody that can answer it for you. I mean, yes, the BBC, if they're funding the film, can say, well, I'm not going to, sh you know, you can't do that because it goes against our guidelines. It's misleading, but, you know, I don't give a damn about that. I mean, the film's for the BBC and other people, and it's only me that could decide, really, and, and through the criteria that I've just explained. You know, so it's kind of, it's an interesting area. And there are, you know, there are some filmmakers that go to a whole other level in terms of doing this kind of stuff. I mean, you've probably seen, I don't know, the act of killing, for example. You know, where murderers are actually kind of recreating and um, forming their own 
torture and all of that. Um, so just something to really engage in, I think, to kind of think about what it is you can do and can't do. And, um, and ultimately, it's, you know, it's just about feeling free, free to, to make the most interesting film you can make. You know, it's, it's no more complicated than that. Um, so just, you know, just now you know the whole thing is sort of set up. Of course, you know, she, people don't walk through this sort of old arch in the middle of nowhere. I mean, there's no terminal. We never see a terminal that she comes through off the ferry and, and all of that. And this bus stop isn't the bus stop to London, of course. I mean, what kind of bus is going to stop there and take her all the way to London? <laughs> um, but why do, you, why do you think I'm choosing these particular locations? Or why do you think I'm, yeah, not going with the reality of where the bus arrives and why do you think I'm... It's more of a clash of the Sorry? It's more of a clash of the Yeah, and it's to do with atmosphere. I'm trying to find a suitable, suitable atmosphere, you know, the visual side of filmmaking to, to support and enhance, you know, what she's actually talking about and what's going on. So to find a bus stop in the middle of nowhere where you can hear the sheep is much more interesting than waiting at the busy terminal with bad lighting and, and all the rest of it. And, you know, here actually on the road as well, given that this film is about this road, the next shot is a shot looking down the road, and then we're suddenly in London. So it's um, it's also part of the bigger narrative of the film as well. Um, and in terms of the whole production process, you know, as I say, I didn't shoot this in until I was halfway through the edit, and we had a film with lots of holes in. So I, so we we started to see. I mean, I can come back to editing later on. But we started to see the structure of the film in front of us. I say we, myself, and the editor at some point um, and realised where the holes were. Because if you're working in this way without a script and it's, you know, you're not, it's a process of discovery and I'm not going out to just film what I already know or what I know what I want, but to be open to, to things, then, you know, it's risky because, you know, it can be difficult to find a structure for all these disparate elements that, you know, in your head you think connect together but when they're kind of actually put together um, in reality you know to, to build a film you know you know what works and what doesn't how do you <coughs> all my films I think every film I've ever made apart from one or two have at least four or five people in them they, they're usually kind of ensemble pieces where the characters stories are talking to each other connecting with each other or they're juxtaposed against each other and that's you know within a space, but you know, it's, it's easy to construct a, a sense of space with the lift, you know, you have the, the three walls and the, the door there, it's a physical boundary, but if you're making a film on a road <coughs> or in a town like Calais, I mean, you're having to construct that um, space and, you know, for that to feel coherent and uniform, you know, a, a stage in which all the character stories are unfolding, on, you know, that's, that's quite a challenge. Um, so whilst, you're make, whilst I'm making the films, I'm always thinking about how, how the, these elements are going to work together, how <coughs> individual, and, you, and you don't really know until you sit down and start structuring the film. Um, and it's, you know, I keep, I, I've spoken about not having a script, but what I do do is keep a kind of a log of all the scenes that I've shot, descriptions, and I start to then put them in some kind of order as I'm filming to, to imagine how this film might unfold. And it's never, the, f the finished film is never ever anything like that kind of, that, that script that I'm writing as I'm going along, as it were. It's, it's completely different. So, um, we'll, I'll just give you examples of that uh, as well. Um, sometimes things that you film can just change the whole film completely. Um, and when I first sit down with the editor, he will look at the film, look at the rushes, and, you know, he won't, well, in this case, he didn't know because he's part of the conversation about <coughs> constructing this scene. But often, with many of the scenes, <coughs> he won't be attached in any way to the reality of, of the shooting experience. He won't have all the baggage that I'm carrying. So he looks at the material really, you know, with fresh eyes, and he knows what he knows on a sort of broad level what I'm interested in, and then he he tries to pull that out of the material. Um, and usually, it looks nothing like my sort of script that I've kept 
during the process of making the film, of actually of filming. So it's like starting all over again when I sit and edit. It's a complete discovery for me. So the whole thing is one big discovery, you know, from the minute the idea appears or the, let's say the basic themes come into my mind that it could be interesting to make a film in Calais, I go there, I start doing research, looking for characters, you know, the whole process is one of discovery, which is, I, you know, I think it comes back to, it's a very personal, personal thing you know, that I work like that. It's, it's part of, um, you know, my personality that I, for me, I wouldn't make films that, I mean, if you, if you let's take a film like um, Amy, for example, I can never make a film like Amy, and I'm just not interested to, I might watch it and enjoy it, but I'm not interested in making a film like that. It just, of, of um, telling a story, almost like, a, you know, it's almost like the story exists already, you just have to, you know, piece it together. That sounds very simplistic. But her, but her life story does exist, and I'm much more also creating a, a film out of nothing, you know, there's nothing there. I mean, there's no film before I start making it, this road film, you know, that, okay, the characters are real and they exist, but there's no connection between them in reality. It's all in my head, and I'm, that kind of discovery is, is what's interesting to me, because I'm asking questions about a character, and then giving you another character that's asking another question, and it's, it's a series of questions, you know, so when people talk a lot about what is your documentary about, what is the message, you know, I never have a message, you know, there's, Questions that I'm raising all the time that interest, interest me, themes that are in these people's lives that I'm trying to grapple with. But at the end of the film, all you're left with is, is more and more questions. Um, it's very, very open ended. Whereas, let's say, Touching the Void, a film from, from many years ago about the two mountain climbers, you know, you know the story, it's happened, there was even a book about it. The film is very much a retelling of that. And, you know, again, whilst I might enjoy watching some of those films, they don't interest me on a more profound level, I suppose. Um, I love watching films that have that sense of discovery about them, where the filmmaker is truly making it up as they go along and out there, you know, following their instinct and being drawn to things that, are, that they've discovered themselves. That's what really kind of excites me about documentary. Um, okay, to move on a little bit to... Some other. Are there any questions before I move on to another area? Uh, one here. Yeah. Would you pay someone to act in the scene? Uh, you mean pay a character, pay a person to be in the film over time? Not if it was their sole motivation. I have paid people, but it's usually uh, it usually works like this: that you know we've met uh, during the research period. I feel like, I know, I know they're going to be in the film, I know I'm going to be filming them for a year or so, because I do spend, with most films, a lot of time with people. Or well, let's say I film them over a long period of time, I might not see them every day, I certainly don't see them every day. Um, and sometimes in the budget I, I have money aside to pay them a couple of hundred pounds for their time, for the tea that I drink in their house and the practical things. I would never pay anybody um, if it was just, that was their sole motivation. Apart from once, <laughs> I made a, I don't think it was even the sole motivation, but I, I made a film with a, a rabbi living in Brighton in England who was also living with seven women who, who were his wives, basically. They, they weren't legally married, but they were living. It was Philip and his seven wives, that was the name of the film. And it, at some point, he, I mean, it was after three months or so, I'd been getting in with the family and, you know, getting to know them and, he was very nervous about me making a film, of course, because it was, it was very controversial. At the same time, extremely vain. I mean, I guess a man with seven wives would be. Um, but the question of money did come up at some point. Um, I was going to make an anti-Semitic joke because I can, because I'm Jewish. But um, it was a, we had very funny discussions about money with him, and I, you know, we were joking with each other about it. But he was quite. He did want to be paid for being in the film, and. I thought about it for a long time. It, I, didn't, I didn't feel it was his sole motivation at all. It was part of it that he felt that if he was going to let me be in his life for a year, that he should get some money. And he, they didn't have much money. He wanted some money. Um, and in the end, I agreed. I think I gave the family fifteen hundred pounds, and I justified it in my head by saying, "Okay, each each wife has two hundred pounds, and he has two hundred. 
Um, and there was a matriarch as well, so she got 200. Um, and, you know, to be br you know, blatantly honest with you, like I, you know, me and the producer said, okay, because it can be, it can be, it can raise some really awkward questions. And I, I didn't feel like it was the main reason why he was being filmed, that's why I was happy to do it. And 1,500 pounds is quite a lot of money. Um, and if the newspapers would have found out about it, they could have made a bit of a fuss about it. Probably not enough to be that, you know, but it's, Daily Mail would have loved it probably, you know, anything to trash the BBC. Um, so I think you have to take that quite seriously. Another character I filmed once, uh, once, who's in the film I made about barking, a Holocaust survivor. When I first met him, he said, if you want my Holocaust story, you're gonna to have to pay me some money, <laughs> which I thought I should be filming this conversation because it was extremely humorous at the same time as being quite disturbing. Um, how much is a Holocaust story, survivor story worth? You know? <laughs> we were having conversations about this. It was weird. Um, but most of the time it doesn't come up. Uh, most of the time, I, t I turn around to the people and say, look, can I give you a bit of money for your time after we've known each other for a while and it's not to do... You know, I think that as a filmmaker, I'm really clear why somebody... You know, you can watch all the characters in my films and I can tell you why they wanted to be filmed more or less, or why they were interested. And sometimes it's very banal things that they don't really care if they are or they aren't, so they, they just don't say no, so they say yes. And other times you feel like they really want to communicate something and aren't really thinking about the film being shown afterwards, they're actually getting something out of the process and it's validating them in some way. Um, that happens. That's, that's mainly the motivation of people, to be honest with you. I mean, it, that's, it leads quite nicely onto thinking about Norman, who's in a film I made called Men of the City. Um, you're asking about at what point do I start filming with people, having known them and all of that. And I've touched, touched on it a bit with the live film. But that was very specific because I had to, you know, part of the idea <clears throat> was to, you know, that these people would come to me and I could meet them very spontaneously and didn't have to kind of think about a big introduction to a character. But in this film, Men of the City, it's, it's all set in the square, square mile of, of London, the financial district. I actually started filming at the beginning of 2008 and during the film, the economic crisis happened. Um, I got very lucky, whilst the rest of the world got unlucky. <laughs> Even managed to film a hedge fund manager losing millions of pounds on the day that Lehman's Brothers' bank collapsed. I'm there with a the camera and he's shouting at me to stop filming and I'm still filming and the world's collapsing around us and, and I didn't have a clue what was going on because I have no idea about finance and markets and all of that. All I could tell was that this is not, not a happy time. And, um, <laughs> sometimes you, you, you're in the right place at the right time. Um, Anyhow, during the research for the film, the res one of the researchers I was with, uh, just to pick up on a practical point, I often work with one or two people in the beginning, researchers who walk around the streets, whether it's a square mile or on the road or Calais, wherever it is, and we search out people, interesting situations, and we're constantly looking for something to inspire us. Because you know? I have a sort of early idea that, okay, this Men of the City film is going to be First of all, I didn't know it was going to be about just men in the beginning. That aspect of it came out through the filming. But um, I knew that I was interested in making a, a film very much about the kind of the, the kind of you know the feeling that, or the let's say the kind of main theme of this place, which the you know the extraordinary wealth that exists in this space, and yet the kind of what it does to the, to the kind of human. You know, that was my main thing. Because in the beginning, when I this was actually an idea that came out of the BBC, and they asked me. To, to develop it. Um, it wasn't an idea, they just said, are you interested in making a film in the city? And my initial reaction was, was quite, I was quite skepti skeptical because I, I just had images of men in suits <laughs> in my head and was, was worried about where the, that point of connection would be that has to be there for me. So it took a long time to kind of meet characters that I could really connect with. I mean, in the film there are, it's not just people working in finance, there's a street sweeper, a Bangladeshi guy that sits all day holding a sandwich board sign. Um, so on a, on a basic level, we're looking at, you know, people that are thriving, well, apart from the crisis happening, supposedly thri thriving, who have everything, those that have nothing, and, and people in between. Um, it sounds very crass to have this contrast of wealthy and poor, but it's, it's not as obvious as that, because actually at the end of the film, all these people are sort of in the same boat somehow, even though one is a hedge fund manager and one's a Bangladeshi sign holder, they're all 
they all have their struggles, um, very human struggles that are sort of related to this, to this landscape, this place. <clears throat> anyway, Norman was met during the research period um, pretty much like this. We saw him smoking outside a building because that's where he would go to have his cigar when he, when he needed, a, needed a break. <clears throat> we got talking to him and I wanted to um, film a first scene that, that was similar to how I'd experienced that, that encounter in the research period where I didn't have the camera because you can't, you know, whereas in the lift people could come in and I could just be filming because they kind of knew about it because they'd been warned before. You can't just wander up to somebody, in, well you can just wander up to somebody in the street and start filming. Uh, I, 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 I sort of done that in the second film that I made. But with this film I, I was, you know, casting before, so I was out there researching, meeting those people, then having to think about how do I create that first moment uh, with, with these characters. So let's have a look at, at this. This is uh, 15 minutes into the film before we meet Norman, so you're watching this, this clip here having been introduced to the place and some other characters. So there's, just, just to go right back, I mean what drew me to him was when I first started talking to him, or at least when the researcher met him and then told me about this guy, uh, was that, and immediately you're struck by the way he looks, you perhaps think he's going to be a certain kind of person, and then actually through talking to him you discover something quite different. Um, and when that happens when you're out there researching, it's immediately interesting because you feel like there's... There's a, there's a sort of portrait to be created about this person and there's somewhere to go. You know, there's, when you meet a person like that uh, and immediately they're expressing all this disappointment, um, frustration, unfulfilled dreams, uh, you know, all the things he talks about there, relationship with the father who told him one thing and life turned out very different. You know, when, when I meet a character like that, then I'm excited because there's all these possibilities of exploration, the discovery, again, to really go into their, to their life and unpick and unravel a story uh, with, with that person. And I can imagine immediately that, and it's not easy to then go out and create those scenes that provide you with the story, but I can imagine that it's going to go somewhere. And, of course, if the character is, is, is to mean anything in the context of the bigger idea of this film about the city and what it does to the human soul, then you've got to have somewhere to go. I don't just want to film with 20 characters and people we never return to. So it's important that you can see immediately the potential in a, in a character to, to develop 
Um, even if you're unfolding, I'll sh I mean, how, how to put this? He probably appears four or five times in the film. Uh, and I'd say that in three scenes there are things happening. So he, 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 he quits his job basically in the film and he sort of frees himself from this pressure that he's been feeling and starts out on his own, which is very useful in a, in a, in a documentary where you actually, you know, things change, people change and things happen. So if I, if I was to isolate his, his story from the other characters and just put them all on a timeline, you would see four or five scenes with Norman, you know, adding up to a total of 15 minutes where, and this, this being the first scene that people see an unfolding story. In the next scene, we, what's the next scene we have of him? I can't even remember, but he, I think, oh, he's in a pub and the crisis has happened and he's really, he's really worried about his job. In the third scene, he, he, we discovered, he tells his wife he's quit his job. I oh, know in the first scene he's talking at home about quitting his job and he's on the phone to a business partner trying to sort out uh, a way to do that because he's trying to take clients from the company that he's working for. And then the fourth scene he quits his job and then the fifth scene we go home with him and discover something very personal. I'm going to show you that scene. Um, and it ends, Norman's story ends with him on his motorbike riding around the M25 through a forest and he's, you know, a bit of freedom. Um, and by the way, all the other stories in the film also end up in, in the same inverted commas forest. The street sweeper, who I told you about briefly, ends up uh, in that location. The hedge fund manager, who's losing all the money I told you about, he's out there, he's out there taking photos of his kids uh, in the forest. There's deer around. There's back reference to an earlier scene where a trader is talking about his weekend activity of shooting deer. Um, so all the stories kind of move together throughout the film. <clears throat> but if you isolate any of those one characters and put them on a timeline, you know, each, each character is moving forward and unfolding a story with them, even if it's just a static situation where I'm getting into another area of their life, it, it feels like and it is providing you with a kind of deeper you know, journey into this person's existence. Um, so it's not that I know how I'm going to do this at the beginning of the film, but I have to feel that there is somewhere to go uh, with the character before I start filming with them. And we can have a quick, yeah, fine. For instance, you didn't know at the beginning that he would leave the job and so on, so. No, you don't know, that's the thing. You don't know. So potential and you decide Yeah, but what's there, which is interesting, is that, and I found this with so many characters that, that they're a bundle of neurosis like Norman. And I recognize it because, you know, I'm also a bundle of neurosis that, with people that have things happen, there's things that, there's, you know, there's stuff going on in their lives that's very much to the surface and sometimes, you know, when you're filming then things change, you know, and maybe even the filming can sometimes affect that. I mean, I never once said to him, look, Norman, you must quit your job during this filming period, otherwise, you know, my film's a disaster and, you know, my career's over, you know, of course I would never... I might intervene, but I would never like phone up his boss and say, "Do you know you slept with a prostitute last night?" You have to actually have to sack him immediately. You know, um, some filmmakers might do that, by the way. Um, they might, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't, wouldn't put it beyond them, <laughs> especially American ones. Um, but you know, I think that you get a sense for when things might happen, and we're going to meet other characters in the next hour or so who are no longer with us, unfortunately. You know, the last film I made, two of the central protagonists died during the film um, period which was very confusing, I'll talk about it. Upsetting as well as confusing in terms of filmmaking. You know, you're into a story, maybe I've met Norman and filmed him two or three times and suddenly they die. I mean, what, you know, you're upset, confused, but you're thinking about how the hell am I gonna, what does this mean for my film? As well as how do I handle this? And to have two deaths in one film is particularly complicated. Um, you know, we worked it out in the editing and it, it was all, I mean, you're right that you, you're always looking for things to happen, but for me they don't have to be big things, because I, I, I'm not, you know, I find portrait films also really interesting. With the, I find films where nothing happens, 
interesting if they're good films. So it's not always about the something happening. Um, I think there is an obsession with that, that from funders, for example, like what's happening, what's happening. And I think that, you know, sometimes films where lots of things happen that actually they're not interesting at all, you know, it doesn't mean just because things are happening. But I agree with you in the sense that you've got to find some, <laughs> there has to be some momentum, you know, some development of, of, the, of the story and that does rely on, um, partly relies on something happening. Um, if the things that happened with Norman in this film, like him not quitting his job, I mean, they're not the most memorable, memorable scenes for me, you know, actually, but they, they do kind of serve a purpose. Um, and as I say, I think you get, you know, you can never guarantee these things, of course, you know, and that's what, that's why formats were created, to be honest with you. Um, some years ago, how many years ago is it since, I don't know, let's say, maybe you've never heard of this, but there was a series called Faking It, which was a Channel 4 series where they uh, would get a road sweeper to become a ballet dancer. Wonderful, you're going to have half an hour, 40 minutes of something happening, you know? <laughs> Boring as hell, because it's all completely <laughs> fake and nothing to do with truth in inverted commas, you know? Um, but, in doc you know, in documentaries where, when, like these kind of films where nothing's certain, then yeah, it's a problem for, not only for, for yourself as a filmmaker, because you have to find you have to believe and hope that enough is going to happen, or find ways around that. Um, you know, for, it, for me, it's the construction of some kind of story, you know, basically, which is the challenge. Um, but for funders, it's a nightmare. You know, that's why everyone asks for scripts these days, and you know, and it's and it's kind of ridiculous for certain kinds of films. I mean, I could I can never write a pre-script for any of the films that I've made. I mean, you know, I can write one afterwards. <laughs> um, <laughs> So it's, it's kind of, uh, yeah, something to think a lot about, you know, if you've, if you've got a particular film in mind and, you know, having an eye for characters where some kind of change is likely or how to provoke some sort of sense of change is really important. I mean, on, on that note, if I show you the end scene with Norman, it's quite interesting because I learned very quickly, probably after you know, a couple of weeks of getting to know him, I don't know why this is jumping at me, let me just close it. Um, that he decided that he was married, but he decided never to have children before. Um, and for me, you know, he, for me it was kind of connected to this stressful life, and I don't know, there was, I didn't, couldn't quite ever work it out, but he, you know, he, he was a kind of character that, there was a sadness, a deep sadness inside of him, and you know maybe you can tell that by his the size that he is as well. And there's you know lots of interesting things that we don't ever discuss in the film, but I think you think about when you're watching it, you know it's almost like the subtext of of the invisible things that we do pick up on but aren't stated directly. Um, but I was always very interested to talk to him about why he decided never to have kids, and I just had to find the right moment to deal with a to deal with a very personal. Um, subject like that, um, you know, the right moment, the right time, the right situation. So I kind of was in my head from a very early stage, but I didn't actually film it until I'd known him for like eight months or something, which I believe, you know, made the, made the scene work because it's also, you know, there was a kind of intimacy between us by that point and a trust, more importantly. Um, so the lead up to this scene is that he's on the train coming home from work with his wife after another grueling day. And he, he go, I, th I don't think we show that bit of it, we just start with him in the garden, but he's in his, yeah, they end up in this situation at home, this is his wife, and this happens. How many years have you and Jan been married? 20. Why did you um, decide to never have children? Put a roof over, over our heads was paramount. <coughs> so you were worried that you wouldn't be able to support them? Yes. Do you ever look back on that decision with some regret? No, not really. The world's not a very nice place. 
you wouldn't have wanted to bring children into the world? Mm, not now. No? No, not now. Why not? You would have been a great dad. Probably. Never know. It's a big sacrifice, isn't it, to make? Possibly. I've never had time to think about it. <laughs> Do you mean that, really? Yeah. It's making sure that we can live from day to day. Your work's been that much a burden on you that you've never had time to talk about having children? Yeah. The companies we work for have demanded 110% from us. Once you've done that, there's not a lot left. <laughs> Absolutely love it. It's the view in the petrol boat. The escape. I let that run because I'd, I'd started talking about what the characters ended up in the forest, so I'll just show you. But there'll be lots of things that are lost on you there if you haven't seen the whole film. But <clears throat> some interesting things to pick up on, I think. Um, just to go back to, to Norman. So 
you know, if you think about how we first meet him, man on the street in a suit, smoking a cigar, and then this scene is obviously at the end of the film. You know, you can see how far how far you've gone into a, into a character, and obviously there's things in between, and the scenes in between are more active scenes, I would say, where things are happening and you know, the quitting of the job, discussing quitting his job, etc. So, you know, actually, although I might have spent a year and a half with Norman on and off, he's in you know, in terms of minutes in the film, if I line all his scenes up back back to back, it's probably like 15 minutes or something. So it's not an awful lot of time. So. It's really about that distilling something essential in that character that, that you're interested in and, and moving towards that. You know, 90% of Norman's life for me was uninteresting in terms of filming. Not that he's, you know, not to be rude to him, whatever. It's, I think it's the same with any of us. It's like, you know, I'm always looking for that, that sort of something in somebody's life that would really, you know, that's gonna be the interesting thing. And within a broader conceptual framework, so of course the idea of this film is to look at money and the, the kind of implications of existing in a, in a society in the city that's so kind of doggy dog to use that term, um, you know, such a kind of personal cost on people. And to, you know, that, that's a sort of broader framework through which I'm exploring, you know, through which he's in which these characters exist and, you know, they're, they're the things through them that I'm exploring. So it's not that, you know, it's not that the things in, let's, let's put it like this, you know, I wouldn't simply be interested in Norman's, you know, decision not to have kids if it didn't relate to the broader themes in the film, for this film, you know, it has, it has to kind of connect on, on that level. So you have all these characters, but they're all, you know, touching on this bigger, let's call it a kind of, without sounding pompous, some sort of meta-narrative of the film. So they have their individual stories, but they're all contributing to this grand narrative that I've created. And you might be wondering why, you know, he, I mean, I discovered that he, in this film, in the research, a lot of the people I, I would meet that are in the city would always talk about nature. It was incredible. Like, you know, the, there's a scene I've got this handy because I sorted it out this morning somewhere. Uh, I know it's in my other folder, but it's here. Um, just to give you a sense of where ideas come from. Um, okay, so there's a trading floor that still exists in the city. One of these places where people shout and scream at each other. Okay, what do you do with your time off? Um, Fuck off. off. That's all you're saying. You don't want it.
This is the sequence that leads to discovering Norman that I showed you earlier on the street smoking. So we meet him after all of that. So you've, so you've not only, I mean, when you watch Norman Isolated, you just meet him, but you know, in the film, you're meeting him with all this other baggage behind you. So, so think about the weight and the kind of, all the ideas that are feeding into that moment when you meet Norman smoking man in the suit. Um, you would have understood by now that this, this, this film, you know, is, I mean, okay, it's one thing, you know, getting a girl to reconstruct a journey on a ferry that she never did, um, but to put animal noises and safari sounds over a group of men in a trading hall is, is also, you know, not very documentary-like, I mean, if, depending on your conception of documentary. So, this, what happened in this film was that um, there were certain things that I filmed completely by chance, in a way. One of them was, uh, during, the, during the making of the film, I got drawn to certain things, and it changed the whole conception of the film when it came to editing. Um, so, so the big thing that happened was the economic crisis, because that wasn't part of the idea. I didn't sit at home and think, oh, I'm going to make the film because in September there's going to be a crash, and great, this is the time to do it, get in there before, and then, you know, we got the kind of, that happened. So that was one thing that changed, changed the film, because I had to, I had to free myself from a very specific event, historical event, it wasn't historical at that time, it just happened, but, you know, a particular, you know, it could be a news and current affairs event, and I wasn't making a news and current affairs film, um, you know, the BBC loved the fact that this crash happened and I was making a film in the city, but for me it was also like, you know, it's kind of, it's too specific, you know, how do I, how do I kind of use it, but not in an obvious way. Um, so I had to deal with, deal with that, that kind of question um, as I was going along, and think of ways to use it sort of more metaphorically than realistically. So whilst we do see the crash in the film, it is represented in the film, it's certainly not what the film is about, because um, for me that would be too, too narrow. I'm using, it's, it's great in terms of it gives the themes inherent in the film, kind of, you know, it elevates them because of, because of the event, but it's not, the film's not about the event. <coughs> but I, I filmed a very incidental moment at a bus stop with two guys. I spent all day filming a demonstration in the city uh, that was, you know, do you remember after the crash there was lots of demonstrations in the square mile about um, banks and all that? So I don't know why, I, you know, knowing that, actually I did get the street sweeper, to, he wanted to go on the march, I filmed him on the march, but when I was filming it, it felt very bad, it felt like a, a, an issue based film about a protest, and I didn't quite know why I was there. And if, you, if you have that fe feeling when you're shooting scenes, you know, if I don't quite know what I'm doing here, then it's usually, it's usually kind of bad. But on the way home, I had the camera in my hand, and there were two guys at a bus stop. Uh, a black guy and a mix and a homeless guy, and they were having the most surreal conversation. I just started filming it without even asking them, which I don't usually do. It was kind of I don't know. I was fed up and had a bad day, and I thought it just looked interesting. They were talking about whether dogs go to heaven. So it was quite a surreal conversation in the context of you know it was after this day of rioting and it was all a bit weird. Um, and whether the dogs go to heaven, and it was sort of almost quite biblical, and you know, does God exist? And it's kind of a bit, a bit of a kind of, uh, you know, <coughs> strange, surreal, theatrical conversation at a bus stop with loads of rubbish around. Um, anyway, I filmed it, and when the editor watched that back, I mean, I knew it was a good moment, but I had no idea how it might fit into the film. <clears throat> but it ends up being cl quite close to the beginning of the film. And what's good about it is that it's both funny and it introduces some quite substantial themes of, you know, it must feel sort of like Armageddon and there's talk of God and the Bible and it's, it's all quite surreal. And that scene along with um, some other moments, when the street sweeper always felt like a kind of Christ character wandering around this land, you know, praying that things would change and trying to save humanity. It's why he's up on the hill at the end crying at the city and uh, all the rest of it. Um, so there were certain elements that allowed this film to, to go beyond sort of, you know, a very straight documentary portrait or, or film about, about the city. And we pushed those things really quite far and, you know, 
I look at it and I, I like the film. I don't know whether sometimes we push it too far, but anyway, we did. There's the rainbow at the end, you know, is, um, that's not something that happened in reality. It cost 200 quid in post-production. It's quite a good deal at that time. Um, so you can see how I'm using bits of, you know, like if you, if you unpick, for example, all the shots in this sequence, you don't have to turn the lights off, but just think about, you know, it's quite a fast cut sequence, you know. Um, if you just unpick the shots, if, if I took the music away, just showed you the rushes, you know, what, what you have is, when you're watching the rushes just as they are, you can imagine a scene that's cut nicely, interestingly, dynamic, shouting, screaming, um, and all the rest of it. But then I discovered with this character, who's actually Nigel Farage's brother, um, that he goes hunting. So when I was filming, I, want, I knew I wanted to talk to him about that hunting. Because for me, it was interesting, you know, that connection between the aggressive nature of the work and then also the pastime, you know, the two things were, had some kind of meaning for me together. So I sh that, that really was on his computer screen, so I got him to talk about that. And then, you know, this is just a, a screen in the, in the trading floor itself. But when the editor's watching this through, just as rushes, given, given that we're starting to conceive the film more metaphorically, um, you know, more a towel of like end days, if you like, um, you know, all these very real raw moments then start to take on another meaning when you put that kind of soundtrack to it and you're using the, you know, the, the raw elements for another purpose. So it's, it's, that's all possible with documentary, you know, why shouldn't it be? I mean, it's, it's great for me when what, what feels, what could be a quite a banal sequence, okay, but not fantastic, then can become something much more interesting um, and transformative. Well, I thought that the BBC would never let me do that. In term, you know, my justification was that this is a comment upon a group, not an individual. You know, the guy who speaks is never in the film again because he pulled out. He didn't want to be. Um, but for me, it was like not not trashing individuals. It's looking at it was the one scene in the film where we see the kind of system in action. You know, because it's so virtual that actually this this is the only place that exists like that. Whereas all the you know the masters of the universe that are, that are kind of <laughs> destroying everything. It's it's not visual, you know, it's like there's a, somebody sat at a computer screen and that's it, you know. So it's quite hard to like, the challenge of actually finding a place to visualize that, to, you know, to kind of get that thing across is really, it's really difficult. Um, they, yeah, it was, they, didn't, they didn't mention it, it was fine. <laughs> it was fine. They could have done that, couldn't they? They could have said this is really unfair and this is an editorial policy issue. I'm terrified that these people might complain. Um, cut it out, they could have easily said that. Um, it's on the edge, and, but I quite like it for that, that it's quite bold. And I think sometimes you have to be quite bold with your decisions. Um, but I could sit down with these guys and say, look, in any one of them, I wouldn't be scared to sit next to them and say, you know, I, I was there for five days and it was a horrible, horrible atmosphere. I mean, it's the worst place I've ever been in. Not that each individual is a nasty and horrible person, but when they get together, they're like, like, they are in this sequence, and it's quite disturbing. Um, and they thought I was there to kind of expose the, the way that they work with um, the whole mining industry, because it's all, it's, it's the metal exchange, actually. So they, were th they thought I was doing an expose, and they kind of turned against me a bit after day five. They got fed up with the camera in their face. Because this frantic activity only happens for half an hour each day at the end of the day. So I would go there just for that, more or less because um, the rest was boring. Um, it's not like that all the time. So, does someone want to ask something? And there was a shot of a woman sitting in the skirt. Is there any particular reason? There was a shot of a woman. Sitting in the skirt? Yeah, there's one or two women who worked there. But it was mainly a male domain, you know? So I, w I wanted to shoot that and in a way that emphasised the kind of masculinity. And, the, you know, there's pornography all over the walls. You see a little bit of that. Um, only one or two women working there. You know, one has a leopard. Skin. One has a leopard skin. Why do I just show her legs? Because why do you think? I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm getting you to think. It, it's that, you know, the, the men there are hunting. They're predators. They're predators. There's pornography everywhere. You know, I'm kind of 
trying to get you into their world. Um, I'm asking you to think about the links between that kind of mas that display of masculinity and and money and power. You know? And that was before the crash happened, so it kind of comes true. <laughs> and then, so like, so later on, when I the scene I showed you earlier, where they end up in the forest and we're showing deer, it, it's a back reference to this. Um, the guy I told you about was the hedge fund manager, is the guy taking photos of his children. And his story in the film is very much about, you know, this addiction to the screens and the kind of, I mean, he, as his wife says in the film, he could have actually retired and left that life behind years and years ago, but he, uh, he can't. And it ruined his marriage, he's split from his wife. We, she comes to visit him in, the, in his house in Devon and we see her there and they're together and it's very interesting if not slightly awkward. And he's obsessed with taking photographs of his kids and you can see in the house it's just it's like a shrine to his children and the actual reality of his relationship with his kids is really difficult. Um, you know, in that he's separated from his partner and he doesn't see them as much as he wants to. And so in the context of the film and I think in reality too, the photographs become a kind of um, you know, that's the way he really connects with the kids in, in some way, you know. And, you know, he's collecting images of the children, but the reality is so much more difficult to deal with. It's quite sad, but also very interesting. And, you know, and in relation to the Norman's thing with the kids, you know, it becomes, you know, again, interesting to think about. Um, and, you know, just, just to, just whilst I've shown it, just to go back to some questions around editing and structure. When you're, when you're, you have, you know, if you're making a film like this where there's, lot, there's multiple characters and you're trying to create the feeling that things are happening at the same time, which is totally artificial, of course, you know, this, this moment here where he's in the forest taking pictures of his kids, And then we see, you know, this is in Derbyshire somewhere, and this is in Richmond Park in, in London. Um, there's not much documentary fact or truth going on there. Um, but I'm thinking about how to create unity, you know, how to, how to join these things together in, in a very visual way. And for anyone know, that knows Hampstead Heath will recognise that this is up at Hampstead Heath which is nothing to do with Richard Park or Derbyshire. Um, back in his home, and then we come out again to a view of the city. But, you know, so it's kind of, even the, you know, even just the, you know, when you're putting one image next to another image, you're, I'm, you know, creating a lie for, a, for, for reasons of film structure that for me are creating something coherent and, truthful in terms of the story that I want to tell. But it's, there's nothing real about it, you know, in a factual documentary way, in, you know, in the way that we might expect. And I think that it's really, it's the first thing to get your head around, I think, when you're, when you're working with documentaries that, you know, there's an expectation, because um, historically, you know, documentary was born out of a sort of, well, actually, even some of the earliest documentaries are completely fake. But for some reason, we think the documentary is real, factual, correct, can't be questioned, you know, same with the news. It just is like that, and that's how it is. And, you know, we all know, if we've studied, if we've done media studies, that it's, it's a total nonsense. But it's really important to remind yourself of that when, when you set off to make documentary films, I think, or films that are going to be called documentaries. Because actually, you can do what the hell you want, and that's what's exciting about the form. And I think that, you know, if you don't kind of realise that and grasp that, your films will be predictable and quite boring. I mean, there's so much of the real world filmed now that it's even more important to kind of to, to, to create something different, to, to, to realise something that's um, not just a, you know, a duplication of, of, of reality, but... On the other hand, you know, I would say that um, I'm, I'm not a great lover of films that are over stylized and lose. You know, what I like about 
the work I do in the sense that I can have you know, a moment with Norman in his garden, which is very real in the sense that there's no stylization. He's talking about his kids and it's very emotional and all the rest of it. And then it can be up against a completely constructed artificial thing of a rainbow appearing in the sky and, or whatever, whatever it is, and something that's much more artificial. But, you know, so I think for me, the, you know, those very authentic, non stylized moments are also really, really important. Um, and I don't tend, to, I'm not drawn to films where you really lose, you know, there's a lot of films being made at the moment that, that lose, for me, any sense of authenticity um, in the, because the stylization hasn't created more authentic, authenticity. It's, it's created layers that remove me from something that I, I feel is real, you know? So it's not like I'm trying to argue for something anti-realist because I think the, the realism, if you like, if you want to use that term, is, is really what's crucial here, you know? It's the, the, the basic things, the emotional lives of the people are what, for me, make the films interesting. Um, but the kind of scaffolding around that, you know, has to be, has, has to go beyond the kind of, as I say, the mere of kind of replicating reality in some way. So I think it's just, to think about that is really important. Sorry, that's a question. Of course. So when you drop in, like, a stop at the start of the road, are you kind of inviting people I don't really want you to watch the film and think too much about this, you know, to, to be thinking too much about, I mean there are filmmakers that really, you know, are constantly deconstructing the, the filmmaking process in the films. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the work of Ben Hopkins. No. I mean there are filmmakers that are obsessed with always drawing your attention to the artificiality Films. I mean, even fiction. I mean, if you think of Kiarostami, the Iranian filmmaker, I think it's the what's the one? It's the guy that's going to suicide. One taste of cherry, I think it is. That, that, you know, he completely at the end of the film kind of you know exposes the artificiality of it. There are also documentary makers that are constantly kind of reminding you of, of the constructedness of the film. Um, and I think I do that, but it's, I hope I don't do that just for the sake of it because I don't think it's interesting just to constantly remind. So I'm sort of you know. I don't think you ever forget that, that this is a, I mean, it's a, I don't know, quite know how to answer that. I don't want you to be thinking about that bus stop sequence as a fake sequence in the sense that it's reconstructed. I want you to go along with the emotion of it. If then, because it's not really, it's, I'm not doing it for any other reason that I think it's the best way to tap into the emotion of that character and that it solved some practical problems for us and that it introduces the actual road and etc. Um, but when you're doing it, are you kind of knowing that anybody who lives there has travelled through that thing is going to be able to say? Yeah, yeah, and I don't, I don't even think I care about that. It doesn't even, I don't, I'm not interested whether, you know, Mr. Smith from Hollyhead, or Mr. Jones from Hollyhead probably watches it and says, oh, hey, that bus stop doesn't go to London. I mean, I, I really do, really don't care. Um, just not interested. There was somebody who was like, wrote an article about the film that was furious about all those things when I spoke about it, got really upset. Um, and I think then it just comes back to people's expectations of documentary and I, I would argue that you should change your expectations because I could have made a really boring film if I stuck to factual, you know, accuracies um, and I'm just, it's not what interests me. Yeah? Um, I'd be making, you know, current affairs programs if that's what I was really interested in, full of facts and figures about, you know, the amount of people that come from Ireland to to, through Hollyhead to London, and you know, I'd kill you with kill you with the facts. All those, you know, having just mentioned that, I mean, <coughs> there are in, in this film there is a, there are sequences that draw on historical things, patterns. There is a there there is, there, there, are, there you know there is history in, in some of the films that I make. For example, one of the other characters in the film, The Road, is an old Irish guy who is living. Um, out to the last days of his life with a generation of people that came to London to work in the 50s and 60s. And within his sequence I show some archive material um, of that time when the Irishmen were you know, coming over and waiting on the streets to be picked up for work. And it's shown in the context of Eastern Europeans waiting on the same street corner today. Or actually, it's not exactly the same street corner, but it feels like it could be. Um, 
So when I, you know, even when I'm using archive, which if you think about documentaries that use archive, it's, <coughs> or some documentaries that use archive, use it in a very, you know, it has to be that moment, that place, very specific. It's much more of a, an artistic way of, of impressions and suggestions. So when you watch that sequence, it doesn't matter whether it's the same street. You, you know, you're, I'm asking you to reflect on, you know, maybe more of the poetics of the fact that these people are standing here now, you know, patterns repeat themselves. Another time it was black and white and, and you've got similar faces and they're smoking. So it's picking up on those, I'm more interested in, in those, you know, impressions than the sort of historical, but, I, but in that sense, I'm still using you know, history in, in a way to kind of communicate those ideas. Um, just, uh, how much time do we have just to get a sense of where we can go? Okay, we have another. Are there any other questions? I wanted to show you what kind of... Da, 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 da. I can throw it open a little bit. I have places to go, but if there's things that... Um, aspects of filmmaking that you really want to talk about, just let me know now, otherwise I'll get carried away into a new sequence of events. Please just, if there's certain areas that you'd like more on, whatever, just let me know. Okay, um, in that case, I was going to show you, maybe I'll show you the beginning scene first. It's a, uh, or maybe we should move it on. Um, Okay, I'll show, you, I'll show you this one first. This is a scene from a film I made uh, in, in Barking, in, on the outskirts of London. And I'm showing it, it's a kind of, it raised a particular problem uh, that I think we've touched upon a bit, but more, more less intense way somehow. Um, so this was a, this film became about When I, when, I, when I started doing the research, the British National Party had just won um, the second largest amount of seats on the local council, so that was the context and reason for me going to Barking. Uh, you probably guessed that I wasn't going there to make a film about the local council. But what was interesting was that uh, because of what was going on there, it seemed the perfect time to make a film about how people relate to the other. So in this context, it was kind of the local white English population relating to immigration, so mainly in that, well, all kinds of immigrants in that area, but there was a, also a lot of uh, immigration from Africa. And when I, during the research phase, um, at some point I came to the conclusion that the best way to approach this was to, cut, to try and make a kind of comedy of multiculturalism, because otherwise it felt like an open university film, you know, where it was sort of, in the town of Barking, you know, black and white people live side by side, but they don't really, you know, it's all felt very dry. Um, and naturally, I always seek out characters that have an element of kind of humour in their, in their stories, because if it's too sad, too depressing, it, it's too sad and too depressing. I, you know, I, I, I like the kind of life in the shade, so where the kind of life struggles sit side by side with, with humour as well. So I, I was seeking out this... Um, I suppose, you know, what, I mean, it's not too dissimilar from the lift that, you know, the, the little moments in the lift that are quite funny where the woman talks about counting white people, you know, I really like that sense that, you know, especially in a place like London where people from all over the place are living side by side, you know, on top of each other. And there's a lot of humour in that, you know, it can also be very sad sometimes and people can get very isolated and lonely, but there's, there's a lot of awkwardness and, and the way that people come together or not and, the sense of people confronting their fears and all of that stuff, which is, I think, a very human thing of, you know, fear of the other. You know, when any of us meet each other, there's always a certain amount of trepidation going on, how you see yourself in relation to other people. And in a sense, this film is, is just, you know, taking a look at that within this very specific context. So I met Sue, again, a bit like how we met Norman. How we met Norman. One of the researchers met her on the street. and. Immediately she started talking about changes in the area, <clears throat> how she felt very uncomfortable about suddenly her street becoming like a mini Africa um, over a, you know, a very short amount, space, um, amount of time. And when she was talking to the researcher, she was whispering because 
in the suburbs and everyone can hear you because it's quiet and she was very kind of cautious. And I loved the idea of that when the researcher told me about Sue, that she, you know, that she, when, and when I went to met her, I, I, I sort of, you know, she had a great kind of comedy value about her. But ultimately felt really passionately and, you know, had very interesting thoughts about what was going on. I mean, sort of, in a way, crazy thoughts, because she was very, you know, fearful. She, she was just, she had a lot of irrational thoughts about Africans in the area and, you know, the, the difference, the, you know, their differences and was kind of visibly sort of shaken by it all, which is interesting. But we'll talk about it in a very funny way. So this is the first scene I filmed with her, which, actually, it's the second scene I filmed with her. The first one was a, it didn't work. I tried to film her on her doorstep, um, where she's also whispering to me about what's going on in the neighborhood. And when we watched it through, it just felt very sort of dry. So I tried it again in this situation, and, and then we'll watch it and I'll talk about why I think it was much better. It's the opening scene of the film, by the way. Paris. From, but I thought it was Poland. I said to Poland, he said, no, we come from Albania. So I said, oh, right. And I thought, when I got in here, after I've been speaking to him, I thought to myself, Albania, where's that? Could be anywhere off the end of the world. You know, I haven't got a clue. I mean, I don't know a lot of geography, but I know women's countries, that's not the map, but <laughs> I did know where Albania is, and I still don't. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, I've lived in Barking and Dagenham all my life, and uh, and I, I'd still rather have nice foreign neighbours than nasty English ones. Does it make any difference to you that they're, they're white rather than they were African? Oh, <laughs> yes. Yes, it does. They're, they're a different nature to the Africans, these, these people. They're, you can get some Africans that have got a, a bombastic manner. Um, and there are some, and I oh, know I wouldn't like one of those. And then again, I, I don't think it's colour. Would I sooner white than black? Yes, I would. Yes, I would. Why is that? Uh, their cooking is different, so you've got the smells. And yet, I told you we spend a lot of time in the garden. Um, also, they're very, 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 very noisy. And they like playing their music quite loud. Yeah, so she's not scared to, uh, you know, say what she thinks. <laughs> which is both amusing but also, you know, underlying what she's saying. It's interesting, it's like, how can she be scared? You know, it smells of food, why, why, what's going on there, you know? So after I filmed that, um, I was both very happy because I watched it through and I could see that Oh, this is a good moment. Just to, just to go back a bit, um, the reason why this scene on the doorstep, which is pretty much in the same sort of content, didn't work for me, was that it was a bit too, you know, like an interview, you know? Um, I never use the term interview in what I do. This, this moment for me is, is a scene, you know, it's not an interview. I'm not, there's no formality about it. I'm not, you know, it's not a questions and answers session in that sort of classic interview way. Um, so when I turned up at her house to film it again, you know, and I, when I say it, I just wanted to find a way to get her to talk about her fears, this, what it is that she's scared of with this African thing, what, what's going on there. And when I turned up, I noticed that her Albanian neighbour was in the garden and I thought, this is perfect, you know, just get her to sit by, in this situation by the conservatory. We can see him coming out. She's got something to react to. It gives some life to the scene, you know, something's happening. So the, the something happening thing can be on a bigger, bigger level in terms of like, oh wow, you know, somebody's just died or lost their job or fallen off their motorbike, whatever it is. Or it can be, there's a little man in the background who's gonna make this scene a little bit more interesting than a woman standing on a doorstep and there's nobody there, you know? So, or I have to make it look like there is somebody there by cutting somebody in that, which I do sometimes that you believe is there, and of course they're not, and 
Maybe the clever girl over there might notice this guy. <laughs> so there's all kinds of, you know, there's all kinds of ways to kind of look for, for to maximise the potential of a situation. And you can't sit, sit at home and imagine or dream these things up. You know, I turn up at her house and this is going on and I'm sensitive to it, so I asked her to, to sit there and just to sit there and look at him. So in the beginning she's just, um, we have a bit of that I think, she's just sitting there and looking over like this. You know, she might have been there 20 minutes doing that because I would have asked her to. And then at some point I would have, she gives a little wave, maybe I said, I might have even said to her, why don't you wave or acknowledge. Um, so I do sometimes give direction in, in the moment if I feel there's something going on that could enhance the scene. And then she, she starts to talk. Um, and I ask her some quite provocative questions during, during that. I mean, of course, I'd known her for a little bit, unlike the lift. I'd spent a bit of time with her before, so I knew what was in there. <laughs> and I knew what I wanted to get out. I never quite know how it's going to come out, but it, but it does, um, usually. And, and, you know, it's about that thing of knowing what you're going for, knowing what you want. At the same time as being open to, to the discovery of it, you know, because I didn't know that this particular situation possible. Um, yeah, so after, after I shot that, um, fine, good, good scene. I always felt like it could be a great opening to the film because, for, you know, maybe I should ask you, if, if a film starts like that, there is a caption at the beginning because, of course, with the BBC, there was sort of, there's always this anxiety about what the film's about, how are people going to know what it's about, and we spoke about narration and it didn't work for this at all. So we, ended, we started with a caption that just <coughs> factually gives some information about barking and the British National Party, and then it raises a question about how local people are dealing with their fear of the other, in inverted commas. Um, and then we're into this scene. Um, do, you wanna, do you wanna say something? Yeah, I have a question. Um, is there any kind of situation where you try to rein someone in a little bit? For instance, if they were saying something that was so outrageous or kind of so markedly racist or something like that, where you thought that was actually going to there is a situation in this film with another character who, um, I mean, who, who expresses views, and he's a whole different character, there's not much humour in him, he's a very disappointed elderly man who's not dealing with this kind of change at all well, and he is having a discussion with his daughter, who has recently had a, an affair with a ni local Nigerian guy and had a baby, so Dave, the racist in inverted commas, is confronted with this issue right in his own family. And in the scene, what happens is, is that I'm talking to Dave about what's going on in the area and suddenly his daughter arrives home and you see this mixed race grandkid come into the scene knowing what this character's like and it's really interesting because then I'm you know I'm asking Dave well, how he feels about his grandson of course and it's interesting you know it's his responses you know you can read between the lines he's not happy uh, at some point in the scene he starts he says something really awful about the, the his daughter's ex-partner he calls him a, a dog because uh, there was some domestic violence, um, but you know he doesn't separate out the, the race issue and the domestic violence. He just it's all kind of tangled up inside his head. Um, and I, I, I'm filming that, and his daughter challenges him, says you can't say that. So that sort of thing is is in the film itself, and I leave that in. And I'm also quite kind of present when I'm talking to him in terms of challenging him. Um, so if it's going on in the scene, then I, I will, um, if I'm uncomfortable, I'll, it will just come out naturally, I'll, you know. <coughs> yeah, that's how it, but then, then later on you can decide, how, you know, how it's going to be in the film. Um, but, I, you know, I can't imagine cutting something out because it felt too, but, you know, unless there's, I don't know, it's a difficult one to answer, I'm not sure I've ever had that, but unless it felt, if, you know, if it felt real and sort of, Authentic, whatever you know, you know, that feeling of authenticity was there for me. Then I would argue to keep it in. You know, if it felt like it was somebody was playing up to the camera and just you know performing in an interest, you know, interesting way, which people do sometimes, then I would n not show it. You know, so it works like that, really. Um, 
I was about to say something about yeah, so this scene, I always think, thought this could be a good opening. So I was quite happy with this scene once I shot it. Um, then I had to, so like with Norman, you know, I, I meet the character and can sense where it might go. I don't know what's going to happen, but you have a feeling that there's stuff there to explore. I had the same thing with Sue, but the big difference here was that, you know, Norman's, uh, Norman's um, life in the city gave me some sort of, visual scope, I could film him at work in this big machine of the Lloyds building, we see him in there. Um, and there's certain things that, filming situations that presented themselves to me. With Sue, so much of this and so much of the people's fear of the other is inside people's heads. So it was very difficult to work out, or very challenging to sort of find a way to, um, you know, to, to, to visualise that, to, to externalise that, let's say, to create a scene out of it. Um, so what I came up with in this film was probably the most uh, intervention I've ever made in a film. Um, I won't show you, I'll describe what happens, I'll show you the actual combination of it, but the next time you see Sue, she's, she's watching her neighbour, who's an African guy, on my camera on the flip out screen and I'm filming her watching it and Sue's husband's there as well, it's, like, it's a two shot and she's watching on the screen and we're watching his neighbour talk about how he feels uncomfortable about what's going on in the area. It's a Nigerian guy. Um, and Sue's watching it and then at the end of the scene she turns off the camera and I say to her, out of the blue, completely out of the blue, there's no preparation for the audience, that you know, would you go around to his house to have a meal because he wants to host you and your husband for a meal for the evening. Um, so I've organised this dinner party which I'm now declaring to you, the audience, um, and she doesn't know I'm about to ask her that question and she gives a very funny answer. It's sort of, oh, well, I don't know, you know, and what if they cook food we don't like and all of this stuff and I hope they, well, I suppose we could always ask for a cheese sandwich and um, so I set up this scene that's going to happen in the film and it's a way for me to, and for the film to explore soon through something happening that wouldn't have happened unless I, the filmmaker, you know, would have set something like that up. So do you want to have a look at what, what happens when she goes around there? Um, it's, it's funny and moving, I think, and was worth the stress of doing it. <laughs> it, was, it was a very, just a, well, maybe I'll tell you at the end because then you can see for yourself. But it, was, it took a lot, of, a lot of setting up. It was difficult.
So you've prepared a nice meal for us. Nice there is one food we call panedia. Panedia. Right. Something like potato. I got you. Mm -hmm. We are told we have a kind of mortar we used to pound it. But now it has been turned to powder. So we just mm -hmm. mix it. A mortar, I want to explain to you how what looks like. Mortar is a kind of. Do you know mortar? Mortar? Yeah, yeah mortar. No. How do you look at mortar? Mortar. Mortar. No, no, no. We are using it to pound the alpaca. Right, like wheat. No. Just like mashed potato. Yeah. yeah. You know, you have a kind of. Uh, something you use to mash it. I think yeah. you use a tool to mash it. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we normally use a bigger one. Oh, bigger one. A bigger one. Okay, yeah. To, to measure, yeah. To measure the back hole. Yeah, we can't do it. Well, we do it. Bad bill, please. Can you can you not use a potato measure? No. Not possible. Not possible. I hope you'll be able to try it tonight. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Sometimes when we take this, we put a little of this, but you may not want to use this because of the pepper. So just a small piece. Just a small piece. Hello. Yeah. 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 Right. Very sweet and delicious. So this type of food, where we have special occasion, where we have special occasion, special occasion, occasion. Yeah, we just eat it anyhow. Yeah. <laughs> That's real appetizing. Oh, it does look like mashed potato, doesn't yeah, it? Exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do now. Okay, then. Yeah. Guess what you can do? <laughs> this is the way we're eating bubble. Look at this. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. You eat like that when you're here, don't you? When you're alone, you eat like that, don't you? Yeah. Oh, she's very, very, very African, isn't it? Absolutely, I do. Yes. Right, what are you doing? <laughs> I thought it was chicken. It's goat. And that's right, that sure like mashed potato, isn't it? But it's just a different texture. Slightly different, a little bit more rubbery. It is lovely. Thank you. Have you said? Have you said? Thank you. Thank you. This is nice. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm eating that now, I am. I've eaten my cow scrub. I must admit, it's a bit chewy. It's glutinous, very glutinous, isn't it? We don't like soft meat. We want to chew it and salt it around. I think it's a bit chewy. Something like that. Well, then, I've not left nothing, my friend. Oh, thank you very much. Enjoy. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Have you ever tasted anything different? Different, but enjoyable. Enjoyable. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
so you know this, this again it's it's done for to progress the film to progress Susan's character her story her get inside you know because you know when I I would never have cast somebody in this film I mean Dave Dave who's the most sort of extreme character in the film is only in the film because actually I felt that what his, his story is really about was the kind of lack of, uh, in a way, his, the, the, you know, difficulty of accepting change through as, as, you, as you age, you know, and it's, you know, it's a, these are all kind of working class people that move from the east end of London out to a place like Barking, you know, none of them have gone to university, pretty uneducated, you know, certain kind of person and we shouldn't, we shouldn't kind of chastise those people for, for the way they feel about what's going on. I mean, actually, I think it's like really important that, you know, that, that, they, that you, and then the film does that, it really gives them time and space to talk about, you know, their feelings and, they, you know, they're humans. Just because they haven't had a chance to go to university doesn't mean they should, they should be dismissed as all racist. And, and most, you know, the large majority of people out there aren't at all. They were, their vote for the BNP was sort of about desperation in a way. The Labour Party completely deserted, deserted them and, and wasn't standing for, for their views and thoughts. And of course, in the areas like that where the housing's cheaper, they're always the areas that kind of suffer, in inverted commas, the most. You know? So for me, it was much more of a kind of class issue than a race issue. <clears throat> and, 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 and then above that, even it was to do with hum, you know, human nature and difficulty of change. Um, <coughs> and in the, in the film, Sue has a barbecue in the summer where she invites her, her neighbour, the Albanian guy, around and the Africans come around, um, Dixon and his wife and the kids. And it's a really interesting scene because you have a you know an Albanian family, an African family, and Sue and her husband in the back garden on the summer's day. And I, I really ask quite provocative questions to you know to both to Dixon and, and his wife and the Albanian couple. And especially with the Albanians, I you know, because it's there were also Serbs living on that street as well. And I asked the Albanian bloke about how he would feel if his son married a Serb woman, and he gets very disturbed, of course. And, um, he starts sort of <laughs> punching his fist. Um, it's quite interesting. So, you know, the film then pushes it beyond sort of the white local population and, you know, it's not just their fears, it's kind of, you know, microcosm of, of everything that's going on. Um, so, it's, uh, I can't remember what my point was here, what I was going to talk about, but, um, oh yeah, so, you know, that gives another, out of that one decision to create this, this scene, it, it then also allow for this other, barbecues seem to happen and, um, and again Sue's in the film four or five times maybe 15 minutes or so there's a scene at the grave of her son who died from cancer um, not simply because I wanted to have a scene with Sue talking about her son that died but because through that situation you really feel Sue's connection to the area her son is buried there it's like you know it can't get any more concrete than that and she talks about that she couldn't move away, but she'd always come back because that's where her son is buried. And you really start to understand people's feeling for a place, you know, and that sense of rootedness that people, some people really need and connect with. Um, and by the end of the film, you know, she starts off as one kind of person, slightly kind of cliche, if you like, you know, stereotypical in a sense. But by the end of the film, she's something very different. And I like that in the, that complexity in the characters that I might present you with a person who you immediately make up your mind about. I think people do with Dave as well in the film, and by the end of it, there's something very different from from um, you know from that you know they're, they're complexitized, um, and I think that, so you know in a sense that's what I'm always looking for in the characters that there is that that level of complexity. And it's not, you know, nothing simple, as, as it usually <coughs> isn't, you know. Um, and if the characters are more simplistic, they're, you know, they're usually less interesting to me. Um, there's a scene that I really like, which is, it's a really quite depressing moment in the Calais film where Ijaz is a uh, refugee from um, Afghanistan. It's at his lowest ebb because he's, he's been on the streets for three weeks. It's pouring rain, it's cold. You can feel like the misery 
and I'm there very close up in his face with the camera and it's, it's you know, we've really built up a relationship with each other by that point in the film and you're really feeling for him and, and I ask him, you know, why he doesn't want to stay in France. It seems crazy that he's going through all this struggle and, and he turns around and says, you know, in a very dry way that he doesn't like French people. And, you know, so even he jazz, you know, the hero of, the, you know, the most innocent, lovely character, you know, turns around and makes a funny remark about the French. And it's that sort of thing that's, you know, it's, you know, it's in everybody, isn't it? And it's, with a lot of people, it's harmless. You know, it's only the few that take it to an extreme. I did, I did meet people in, well, I met one person in Barking that was in a pub reading Mein Kampf. I would never have cast him in the film. It would have been totally uninteresting. You know, nowhere to go. It's, I, it's like with films about people of faith, you know, I find it really dull because it's, it's a very close, there's sort of nowhere to, um, to go with it. There's endless films about settlers in Israel, for example, and I find it's very difficult with that kind of character who's got their mind made up about everything. For me, they're not, it's not so interesting. It's very, you know, it's, you might be fascinated with them for a bit because they're an extreme, but actually the extreme becomes very dull and closed. Whereas for characters that are full of doubt and, you know, have ex are experiencing difficult things, very human things, you know, where there's complexity, they're unsure, they're, you know, there's much more movement. That's always, for me, more stimulating, more engaging, and probably more true to how most people are in a way as well. You know? So I think that it's kind of what I, what I look for in a character. How are we doing for time? Just to, we're kind of probably nearly, nearly there, no? Um, are there any, um, any aspects people want to pick up on? I could talk briefly about endings if you want, just because it's, you know, how you end the film. Yeah, yeah. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I just think, I think because it's, in a way, it's because of what I've just described, that things aren't definite and certain. All, all, you know, a lot of the films, well, I think all of the films I make, I'm, I'm very conscious that the, the ending is, is another beginning. In a way, so when you, when the film finishes, you, you know, hopefully these characters are still alive because, some, as I said, in one of the films, two of them weren't. But even even in, in that case, that they sort of somehow live on in your mind, and I think that uh, that that is really important to me. I'm, I have a very um, instinctive dislike of, you know, the classic sort of Hollywood film on many levels, like the sort of classic three act structure. Of, I find terribly problematic, and just in terms of what's going on in the in the industry, especially for those documentaries that um, are perceived to work in the cinema, or maybe not perceived, but they do make money in the cinema, they follow a very classic Hollywood model of creating this three-act structure. So if any of you have watched sort of, uh, I don't know, Searching for Sugar Man, for example, which is an enjoyable film, for me it's very closed and not that interesting ultimately. I enjoyed watching it, but I'll never watch it again. It's not a film that I'll return to. And it has a very classic kind of three-act structure that, you know, set up the conflict, you develop and resolve and everything's sort of closed. I suspect, you know, well, I get, you know, a lot, of, a lot of films follow that model. For me, it's really uninteresting because it's, that closure is, is something totally artificial, that, that way of, I mean, I think you need to, of course, find a way to close the film, but I hope that, you know, and I strive for the, for the, for the endings to be, you know, open in the sense that characters might, in Calais for example, well, maybe I can, I can line it up so I can show you, but in Calais all the characters um, are left in a very uncertain way. So Ejaz is, I've got that scene, uh, for those of you who have seen Calais you might, or that even those who haven't you'll, you'll still get this, get this little moment, let me just find it, um, probably you here. Uh, so this is Ejaz who I was describing just now. This is how I leave him in, in the film.
This is the refugee's life. Understand? Please catch you tonight. Maybe they will send you from Palais to another town. Into the inner city. You will go into the inner city. It might be 500 or 600. Maybe 1000 far from here. Maybe we won't see you again after today. Maybe we will not see each other again. It's different and different. Maybe, yeah. But we want to meet. Yes. Are you going to try to go into tonight? Yes, I will try. But I'm not sure that I will succeed. Because security is very alert, very tight. I don't know what happened, what will be happening tonight. Maybe we can say goodbye. Yes. Yes, Thank you. Only pray for me. Because I don't have anyone. I am alone. I might not really see him again because he tried every night to go across to England and um, so I, I knew it could be the end scene but then I realised that this queue for the food would be a good way in which to, to lose him so I remember like he was queuing up and I was shouting at him to look at me he just stare at the camera stare at the camera you know so he's kind of so he's engaging you and as he's getting pushed along and moves out the frame and you know rather than sort of having a let's say he would have got to made it to England, called me up like I asked him to, I mean, if he did, he never did. Um, I don't know what happened to him, I've never seen him again after that moment. Um, let's say he would have called up and said, oh, I'm in England, you know, would I have seen and shot another scene with him over here? I mean, I don't know, but probably not. Um, in a way, it's much more powerful to leave him like this. Then you kind of start to, if you're, if you're engaged in the film, I mean, so many people ask me about him. They just, and, I, and it's partly, because of how he is as a person, but also partly because of how he's left, it's very uncertain. You have no idea what's going to happen. In a sense, it then allows you to kind of relate your own and project your own feelings onto him, which I think is really important. I think in the lift film, because of the limitations of that space and what can be shown, for example, I never, you know, I can't show things in people's lives they often talk about things and it's left to us to imagine and we're, you know, we're filling in the gaps and I find that really interesting. It's part of you know, the idea of leaving you know, as much as you can to the imagination of the viewer, not being over explicit with everything so nothing is left to the imagination. You know, to keep, keep a balance there where you, you kind of get enough out of the scene but you're also left to kind of imagine for yourselves, project your own thoughts and feelings onto these people because then that's when it starts to kind of work in you somehow I think. so especially in relation to endings I think that's really important that you kind of create that well you don't kind of close things off neatly because you feel that's how films should end because that's how they end in Hollywood but actually the opposite you know the more you can do to I mean you have to have a with all the characters in Cali they there's an English guy who's a kind of English refugee living over there and he drives off in a camper van with his wife down the motorway, you see the camper van going off into the distance, so you don't know what's going to happen to them too. And the other character's also left, you know, in, in a sort of uncertain state. And I think that that's kind of interesting that you, you then, that's the end of a chapter, you know, and then the next one's going to start and you, you can you know, invent your own story about it. Um, I think that's a really important element. But even taken down to individual scenes that, you know, don't, I, I don't think it's, you know, you, don't need to, you know, but you can you can trust in the viewers and the audience's imagination. You don't have to spell everything out, which 
I wish would be the case with more television productions, you know, where everything is spelt out and nothing is left. There's no space to imagine. Either it's full of music, so you have no, no space literally to kind of, you know, they just put music over everything just for the sake of it, because it feels, you know, I think that the, the difference is, is that there's this, people, you know, the producers, executives are terrified of, of silence that people might then switch off. Where actually that silence is often the most interesting thing, you know, that, you know, when you're filming a moment with somebody, you know, let the camera roll when nothing's being said. Very often, the person will then come out with something that is, forms the whole, you know, makes the scene work, or they say nothing, but the face is interesting, you know. Um, I think that, so with a character like Sue, you know, her f gestures and the face is fascinating. You can just look at that and read all kinds of things into her as a character that aren't spelt out, you know. Um, and I, you know you, I think trusting in those things are really, really crucial.